very much, the um, daunting challenge. Um, first of all, um, it's, not, it's not that I intend to make a joke, but I will do so anyway. Because when you described um, Beijing's taxi driver in the 80s, it's almost like going to Central Station here in Amsterdam today. <laughs> Probably more or less the same experience um, if you're able to catch a taxi. Um, you know, I, I found your lecture extremely inspiring because in essence what you said is Asia is out there, it's growing, it's going to be prosperous and it wants to be like you which is a great opportunity for us and it's also extending an open hand to Europe and the West and we should see your criticism in that context. It is not like um, uh, Khrushchev who said in the 70s, we will bury you. Um, that's not Asia's intention. Asia's intention, by and large, is to create a cooperative uh, relationship with the Western world. So that's, on my behalf, the good news. Um, I think that if you look back at European history, the very definition of what Europe is from the very outset, uh, in, the, in, in classical times, in, in, in ancient times, in Greece and Rome, the first definitions of Europe you find is always in opposition to Asia. If Europe is anything, it is different from Asia. And this has been going on for millennia. In that sense, refocusing on the idea of the West, the, the, the age-old relationship between the West or Europe, which is essentially the West is Europe with its expansions to the Americas. <laughs> if that is your starting point, and that was even a joke I meant it. If that is your starting point, then of course it is a tremendous opportunity to rethink a relationship we've been thinking about for 2,000 years, 3,000 years, and which defines us. Because it was always in relationship to a different type of society in Asia that Europe, with all its diversity, was able to discern what makes it European. And that's been going on until very recently. I think that one of the problems you didn't mention and that puts us in trouble recently is that we want to be a values-based society. And we've been relatively careless about these values in recent years. So whenever I talk to a Dutch audience about human rights or values, yeah, 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 but what about Iraq? Which immediately devaluates your values. It, it puts them in a different context and it sort of leads to us seeing ourselves in, in, in very bad lines of deep. And I think this is something we we should be thinking about. You talked about Larry Summers, about the, the wish of Asians to be, to learn, this incredible hunger of Asians to learn. This is something that is fascinating. It's beautiful to see this. I, I was at, at, at Yale, um, I think six weeks or, or two months ago, and the dean at Yale told me, uh, he said, well, you know, we need to do some, recently we need to do some, um, affirmative action, as they call it, with a euphemism. <coughs> and usually when you talk about affirmative action, you talk about Yale allowing people from the projects, African Americans, into their programs. <coughs> but the affirmative action now at Yale is to prevent that 100% of the students would be, would be Asians <laughs> in the United States. Simply if they would select all their students Simply on academic criteria, they would only have Asian students, um, which is a tremendous tribute to those communities in the United States and worldwide. Now, that was the good news for my part. And I want to raise a number of issues um, in reaction to what Kishore had called our mistake, or the West's uh, mistakes, or, or blunders. I read his book carefully and I, to a large extent, fully agree with his analysis of what we did with Islam, the stupidities we've committed in the last 20 years. 
But my question to him would be, perhaps for the debate, if he says the West just does not care if Muslim life is lost, which I think is not a statement I would support, which Muslim country cares if a Muslim life is lost? How much effort do Muslim countries put in terms of military power, in terms of finances, in creating peace in the Middle East? Where are all these huge amounts of money going that are being made in Arab countries? I think this is also a fair question to be asked from the West. It is not just the West's responsibility. 